This session, The Role of Supplemental Parental Nutrition, is part two of the Smart PN video series. I'm Chris Mogensen, and I'm a team leader dietitian specialist in the Department of Nutrition at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Before we can talk about supplemental parental nutrition, we need to define it. Supplemental parenteral nutrition is defined as the addition of parenteral nutrition to enteral nutrition to increase energy and protein intake to goals when enteral nutrition is not sufficient to meet needs. This is sometimes called a bridge therapy, meaning that PN is provided to bridge patients to the ultimate goal of enteral tolerance and meeting all of their energy and protein needs by the enteral route. So what about our critically ill adult patients? The 2016 Society of Critical Care Medicine and Aspen Clinical Guidelines for Nutrition Therapy in Adult Patients also addresses the role of supplemental PN. Similar to the When is Parental Nutrition Appropriate consensus recommendations, this document recommends using supplemental PN after 7 to 10 days for critically ill patients unable to exceed 60% of energy and protein requirements by EN. The authors caution that initiating supplemental PN prior to the 7 to 10 day period for patients receiving some EN does not improve outcomes and may be detrimental to the patient. Three studies evaluating early supplemental PN showed no benefit and one multi-center randomized controlled trial called the Early Parenteral Nutrition Completing Enteral Nutrition in Adult Critically Ill Patients or the EPANIC study showed that patients starting supplemental PN after day eight had a higher likelihood of being discharged alive from the ICU, had a shorter ICU length of stay, fewer infections, and a greater reduction in healthcare costs compared to those patients who started supplemental PN on day three of their ICU course. The question often arises about what to do with the hemodynamically unstable patient. Should exclusive or supplemental PN added to EN providing less than 60% of goal be used in the acute phase of severe sepsis or septic shock? The authors suggest not using exclusive PN or supplemental PN in conjunction with EN early in the acute phase of severe sepsis or septic shock, regardless of the patient's degree of nutrition risk, as some studies have shown increased complications in this patient population, including longer hospital and ICU admissions, longer duration of organ support, such as mechanical ventilation and renal replacement therapy, higher infectious complications, and higher mortality. So let's move on to pediatric and neonatal populations. The use of supplemental PN for neonatal and pediatric patients is also addressed in the PN appropriateness consensus recommendations. As with adults, the question is posed, are there any circumstances in which PN is the optimal or preferred route for nutrition support? For the neonatal and pediatric patient populations, PN is recommended when EN is not sufficient to meet nutrient needs. The practice of supplementing EN with PN in an effort to meet energy and protein requirements seems to be the standard of care for neonates and younger pediatric patients. What about the timing of supplemental PN in neonates and pediatric patients? The consensus recommendations do not offer specific guidance for the neonatal population as PN is begun after birth in infants with a birth weight less than 1500 grams. Data are not available for a specific time frame for more mature preemies or critically ill neonates. There is guidance for infants and older children. For infants who are not expected to tolerate full oral or EN for an extended time, should begin PN within one to three days. For older children and adolescents, the time frame's a little bit longer, about four to five days. Let's move on to critically ill pediatric patients. The 2017 Society of Critical Care Medicine and Aspen Clinical Guideline for Nutrition Care of Pediatric Critically Ill Patients addresses the role of supplemental PN. Based on available evidence, the role of supplemental PN, as well as the time frame for initiation of supplemental PN, is not known. The consensus of this expert panel is that patients who are severely malnourished or at risk of nutrition deterioration, supplemental PN may be started in the first week if EN cannot be advanced past low volumes. 
The group writing the Pediatric Critical Care Nutrition Guidelines used the concepts of the grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation, or GRADE, working group concepts in developing the clinical guidelines. The adult guidelines use the same process. In this case, the GRADE recommendation was weak for starting supplemental PN. As previously discussed, EN is the preferred route of nutrition support for the critically ill child, but PN should be considered when EN is not feasible or is contraindicated. The use, timing, and targeted macronutrient goal when using PN as a supplement to EN requires much more research as there is currently little evidence to guide practice. A recent three-center randomized controlled trial, Early versus Late Nutrition in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, or PEPANIC, just like the adult EPANIC trial, addressed the timing of supplemental PN in critically ill children. The results were similar to adults where the late initiation of PN on day 8 of ICU stay demonstrated better outcomes including fewer new infections, shorter PICU length of stay, shorter duration of mechanical ventilation, lower odds of renal replacement therapy, and a higher likelihood of an earlier live discharge compared to those in the early PN group who started PN within 24 hours of admission. The optimal timing of supplemental PN in children failing to meet their nutrient delivery goals entirely must be individualized based on the nutrition and clinical status of the patient and anticipated nutrient deficits during the course of the illness. So now let's talk about a similar patient. So we have an adult with a history of COPD admitted to the hospital for an acute exacerbation. This patient reports a decrease in oral intake and recent weight loss with a current body mass index of 19. So this patient is absolutely at nutritional risk. Um, this patient has had unintentional weight loss, they're not eating well, and their BMI is at the very low end of the normal range. So on hospital day two, a nasogastric enteral access device is placed and enteral nutrition is initiated with orders to advance to goal. Now we're at hospital day four and the patient the patient's central nutrition is meeting only 30% of energy and protein requirements. Advancing EN to goals has been hindered by GI intolerance. The patient does not have an ileus or constipation. So in this case, is supplemental PN appropriate for this patient? And answer is yes. The patient is nutritionally at risk and unlikely to achieve desired energy and protein goals with EN or an oral diet. It is reasonable to begin supplemental PN to increase energy and protein to goals. This, con this is supported by the PN appropriateness consensus recommendations that PN should be initiated within three to five days in those who are nutritionally at risk and unlikely to achieve desired oral intake or enteral nutrition goal. So now let's revisit this case. So our adult with COPD admitted to the hospital with the exacerbation, nutritionally at risk based on decreased oral intake, weight loss, and the BMI at the low end of the normal range. So we've started our supplemental PN, and now we are at hospital day eight. The patient's oral intake remains minimal, but the EN is now meeting 70% of energy and protein requirements. There are no signs and symptoms of GI intolerance, and supplemental PN is providing about 40% of energy and protein requirements. So the question comes up, should supplemental PN be discontinued? So yes, as enteral nutrition has been advanced and GI tolerance has improved, it's expected that EN can advance to the goal. A plan or a protocol should be in place to wean the supplemental PN as EN is advanced to avoid overfeeding. So this can be particularly problematic in this patient with respiratory compromise. So this is one of the last patients that we want to overfeed. So for many patients tolerating oral intake or enteral nutrition is advancing without problems, parenteral nutrition can be abruptly discontinued. However, for patients who've been slow to advance their enteral nutrition, um, a much slower weaning process is in order. The goal is to avoid overfeeding as well as underfeeding and strong protocols can help with that process. So in summary, Supplemental PN has a role in the nutrition care of patients who are unable to meet their energy and protein requirements with enteral nutrition. The timing to initiate and identification of appropriate candidates for supplemental PN is really dependent on nutrition status and clinical condition. 
guidelines to help you are available in the PN Appropriateness Consensus Recommendations and the Society of Critical Care Medicine and Aspen Critical Care Guidelines for both adults and pediatric patients. And we really encourage you to read all of those references carefully. Here you can see a list of references and readings that may help you in learning more about the use of supplemental parenteral nutrition. This educational offering was provided to you by Aspen, supported by an educational grant provided by Baxter Healthcare. Finally, this slide has a number of links to Aspen resources to help you in managing your patients receiving nutrition support therapy. We hope this presentation and these resources are useful to you in your clinical practice.